Okay, welcome back to my live stream of Ant Kingdom. Today we will be bringing the Night Route Chapter 2. We've done the prologue in Chapter 1, now we're on Chapter 2. Um, previously, uh, I guess, forgive me if I missed something, but the night there was an assassination of the arch of your adopted kingdom. You are a guest knight um, from the neighboring. So you're in the kingdom of Novus. You're you yourself are not from Novus. You are from Vithris, a neighbor of Novus. And there's been there was an assassination attempt on the king and queen, their majesty. So the assassin was not. You decided to start investigating, and in the previous chapter, you continued your investigations and ended by attending a little soiree in the town near by the castle. So today's chapter starts with um, an event that's unique to Nick. Um, if you think you can. Um, the ambassador already attended said event as an audience. We will now experience it as a participant. So, without further ado, it's annoying that I have to go through this every time. Okay, so that was where we left off with the EHAB. Which, for in case people don't remember, EHAB means gift. Rather appropriate for a knight. And their last name, Kadir, means capable and powerful. So I thought that fitting. It's early morning, and instead of finding myself building up a sweat in the training ground, I'm sitting captive in a stuffy carriage stuck between Lydia and Matt. We're on our way to an event out of the kingdom, a joust to honor the traditional pastime of friendly dueling between kingdoms and their allies. It's quite a journey away from the palace, not too far, but just far enough to make this trip awkward. It's the perfect picture of discomfort, a muted cough here, awkward seat shifting there, and the steady creep of the caravan and many of the horses outside is welcome background noise. Sounds familiar? Especially considering no one has bothered to even attempt to strike up any conversation, including myself. At least the caravan is comfy. Matt has been throwing me the occasional glance, his lips twitching pathetically as he apparently decides if he's going to say something. So the moment Livia so much as breathes in his direction, he croaks, clearing his throat, and perishing at the thought. Even before today, there hasn't been much in the way of conversation between us, if any at all. Chatter about the assassination has come to complete standstill, and while the new song piece is somewhat pleasant, some of us are not so pleased. It feels like the calm before the storm. I've heard more than a few times in passing of Masha sharing some words of assurance with the night commander, and every time the reception is indifferent. Livia thanks her and tells her that she knows, but the tight punch of her jaw and her stiff posture betray her. Even now, when I look at her, she looks distant. Her night is still on watch, but if I know anything about Livia thus far, that isn't enough. She means to find the assassin and those responsible for their hire and end this disquiet as soon as possible. Night Commander looks at me as though I've interrupted an important train of thought that pinched back between her brows, but it's fleeting. There for a moment, and then it's gone as if she doesn't mean to show her frustration. Yes? How much longer until we reach the arena? arena? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? This is really our first doubt of a night. She turns and I see her scanning the horizon through the window behind her, the early light barely shining through the curtain. My guess will be soon once the sun rises past the tree line. I see. There's no effort for her, from her to continue the conversation, but I can see Nod visibly deflate beside her. Either that was the one question he'd taken so long to think up but daren't ask, or it soon isn't quite soon enough for him. A heavy silence fills the space again. 
I'm really used to it, to be honest. Livia's taciturn nature, that is. She's not one for the idle, for idle chatter or even a polite conversation, and it could be unsettling, but not nearly as ominous as one might think. Well, sometimes. Night Commander? She side-eyes me. Yes? Forgive me again for asking, but before I can finish my sentence, a shrill cry rings out from outside, cutting through my words. I pause and stare at her, mouth the gate. She seems unsafe. Of course she would be unsafe. It's Livia. You were saying? Sorry, I meant to ask. Yet again, that sound tears through the sky at a much louder volume, almost as if it's approaching with intent. Is that a crow? It fills far too deeply to truly sound like one, and I'm not certain if I should pay it any in mind, or be alert in case it's a me messenger bird. It could be foolish for me to check, and yet... A moment, please. I turn to watch the watch window beside me and push the curtains apart, just enough so I can peek outside. My liege, what are you doing? Confused tone to Matt's words assures me that I look as ridiculous as I feel, but it at least offers me the chance to see that there's nothing out there. Just checking on... Then there's a sharp pinch at my scalp, and I rear my head back as I quiet quickly. Shit! What the? I start a hand through my hair to look for potential damage. There's no wound, went, wound but that bloody hurt. Are you alright? Matt moves forward and reaches out his other hand at the pommel of his sword. I hear a quiet snicker, and I'm just as surprised as Matt to turn and find a mischievous look in Livia's eyes. My jaw is black, and I turn to look back at the window, then back to her. Is there a problem, that Kadir? If I thought I was imagining it before, I know I'm not now. Livia was definitely laughing at me. Why on earth would she be laughing at me? No, I just... Something attacked me just now, I think. Attack you? She scoffed, her lips curled at the corners as if she's daring me to challenge it. I saw no such thing. You didn't? Then what was... Briefly look at Mads so and make exchange the same curious glare. Is this part of some kind of joke I'm not aware of? An initiation part? The pain in my scalp itches and throbs, and I hardly think I'm imagining it. Livia continues to smile knowingly, and then turns to the window behind her once more. She parts the shadows, a fluttering shadow that eclipses the rising sun, and enters the carriage. Maddox hurriedly shrinks away at the appearance of our new guest, when it stops and settles, his eyes widen, and he smiles. There stands a large, sleek, obsidian raven, bride of place beside Livia without a care in the world. So that's my attacker. The impressive bird shuffles on its perch, cooing as it inches closer to Livia when she beckons it. The sharp points of her gauntlet sink into its feathers when she strokes its chest. I think this is the softest I've ever seen her look. So if you remember, in the prologue for the ambassador, we saw a raven, um... Swoop down at Livia, and she smiled and sobbed for a moment. This is the same raven. But it does explain why it sounded like a crow, but deeper. Because if I remember correctly, ravens are larger than crows. So, since they're larger, they tend to be a deeper. They're, the sounds that make are deeper. But being larger doesn't always mean your voice is deeper. The raven pecks and nibbles at the metal in a way that can only be described as affectionate, its eyes closing in its contentment. Livia looks the same, in a sense. She's only at ease, the smile that lights up her face, tender and adoring. But not only seems that this raven belongs to her, a pet or companion of sorts. She catches a staring and averts her eyes for a second and poorly attempts to hide her smile. He mistook your hair for a treat. I do apologize. It's not feeding time for him. No harm done. Well, no real harm done. This is your raven, then, I see? I mean, how buttered up it looks right now is any indication. Correct, though he has enough personality, but I wouldn't necessarily call him a pet. Vinny is a very much his own bird. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> I'll probably look it up. Okay, I thought, um, the usual spot. So we'll just improv. <laughs> just 
Yeah. <laughs> In fact, that nip he gave you was probably just him toying with you. I wouldn't put it past this wing devil, my clever boy. He does seem to be a bit of a trickster, true to the nature of ravens, but he's still charming. He nods and gives a white loving tap to his temple. The bird, or Svigny, responds by fluffing up his feathers and chattering happily, a soft sound that belies his side. Love the image of Olivia with being soft. With the select few. Shows that she's opening up around the night. I forgot that you might not have met Savini yet, Yam. I suppose it's probably because he wanted to make his own dramatic introduction. Very likely. The sound of Maddox piping up catches Savini's attention. He hops onto Olivia's lap, shuffling around on the smooth metal with some difficulty, and eventually moves to flutter onto his legs. The tip of his wings slapped Maddox in, in the face a few times, but he laughed graciously while blowing away the bird gander. A white grin forms on his face when Savini finds purchase on his chainmail and sidles up to him. Careful to pet him in sunspots, a certain familiarity between the two. You seem to know him well enough, Madge. He looks sweet on you, too. I take care of him from time to time. You sell yourself short, Maddox. I know how much care you pay him. I would hardly trust another to watch over him. Uh... He's quite fond of you. Thank you, my lady. He's a delightful lad. Then he coos as though he understands his lady's words. This is the most relaxed I think I've seen that throughout Olivia, and vice versa. How did you two find each other? Did you receive him as a baby? No, I met him by other means. A new smile graces her features and she settles into her seat. The metal on her fingers clinks together as she steeples them. Oh? She nods once an affirmation before beginning her tale. Some time ago, a man from a distant allied land stepped into the court of Novus on a journey of democracy. This land sent someone that was charismatic, handsome, and well-spoken, clearly one of their best diplomats, with a purpose. He extended an offer to parlay for information, a gesture of goodwill between our kingdoms, and attempts to ensure the betterment of us all. Hmm. I'm sure I trust this guy. So, in actuality, it was a thinly veiled excuse to elevate that kingdom by bribery and perhaps even a selfish offer to give his individual services. Of course, there was an ulterior motive. So, of course, St. Barty gets to find all of us. Why wouldn't he? Generosity is an easy ticket to win hearts. Indeed. So when it came to speaking about our military strength and discipline, it was my turn to be persuaded. More like he not so subtly tried to sweet-talk you into giving away kingdom secrets? Something a bit more forward than that. It's not really a secret how capable our knights are. Rather, he tried to recruit me into his ranks. Whoa, okay. Raise my brows. The guy had balls. Indeed. I really have the audacity. She sorts and reaches out to pet to the knee, who still still sits happily with Matt, reveling in the attention he's getting. Well, he was well spoken and presented a decent proposition. This wasn't enough to sway me. I take pride in fostering the growth of my knights and this kingdom, and I'm not for sale. So as a parting gift, he gave me to Zingy, though at the time he referred to him as Nocturne. Um, obviously something to do with night. I know it's been used in... I've heard of names for musical pieces. A piece, okay, so it's referring to music. Be appropriate to the night or evening, an instrumental composition of a cranial sense of character. So probably he was, it was more the first, first definition. She stopped, apparently offended. The same obvious war someone would I think that's supposed to be way. Someone would christen a beautiful blade, something as tacky as blood. Mad's eyes are elsewhere, but it was hard to miss that half of the laugh. He romanced the idea of a dark messenger, trying to wax poetic about how the bird was much like me. At the time, I was annoyed and had no interest in owning a raven, especially one given as a bribery tip. So, the gaze travels over to the bird, and her eyes are alight with tenderness. Someone was very interested in getting to know me. Mads put his, puts his arm out, and Zvigny hops onto it. 
motions to his perch at the window and flies on over, retaking his spot next to Livia. He made that very clear. So you do have a way with animals, my lady. He was smitten with you rather quickly. I remember the time he tried to invite himself to the dinner table because he couldn't be away from you for too long. Dinner on his terms, then. I chuckle and Maxwell's suit. I assume his shyness will prevent him from showing too much amusement in Olivia's company, but then to both of our surprise, she joins in. Yay! And the softness underneath, I love it. This is why I wanted to romance her. He's a bloody good companion, impatient or not. The laugh is harmonious. She looks at ease, almost like she's shouldered off some, some burden she's been holding on to for some time. Not completely gone. There's a noticeable and significant change in the way she holds herself. It makes sense that a good animal companion like Savigny is just the kind of icebreaker needed to lighten the mood of the journey. Savigny looks at her with those black eyes wide and observing. She makes another chattering noise akin to a laugh. It sounds impressively similar to hers. He coos and chatters, seeking attention that Livia is more than happy to lavish him with. It's a charming sight. So actually... So, of course, no question which option we're picking here. The relaxed and almost soft expression that now dances... That now dance... Expressions that now dance across Livia's face are frankly beautiful. It's hard to fault her for being hardened most of the time, and I can't see it's easy to misper and I can see it's easy to misperceive her demeanor as being mean or vicious. But the story she told, the words she said, are not for sale. Someone could interpret that as bullheaded pride, and they're not wrong, but the way I see it, it's pride in serving. Livia carries herself as a cold and stalwart figure, but the woman I see before me now is impossibly warm. I can feel the smile on my face growing wider thanks to her newly infectious delight, but then catches me staring and locks up. Whoops. I'm struggling to think of whatever nonsense reason I can offer for staring at her like an idiot, so by the luck of the gods, or whatever for a me from looking like a dolt, the caravan shudders to a stop, shudders and lurches to a stop. There's a light rapping at the wall. My lady, we've arrived. Livia inhales and rises to stand, the thing knee hopping onto her cloak as she straightens her posture. Rigid and strong, her life has surged back into her veins. Her neck cracks loudly as she stretches and she looks for both of us and nods. Let us join the others. The prospect of finally leaving this buddy box is incredibly refreshing. Okay, uh, I'll look something up. Find it. Luckily, I have two different computers. Okay, so, yeah, we did, as the ambassador, we did see Livia with Vigny on her shoulder um, at the Josh, but Livia didn't introduce us to him. And that's how he ended up on her shoulder. I thought that was the case, I just can't remember. Once we stepped outside, I could see that Livia was right about our time of arrival. The sun is high in the sky, beating down on us in stark in contrast to when we departed before sunrise. So this kind of doesn't make sense. Unless the knights were supposed to get there before um, the guests, which would make sense. It's honestly a welcome sight. Something about having a joust in the dark seems ill advised, so it isn't unheard of. The door to the caravan that had trailed behind us swings open at the behest of their driver and out steps Lucian in all their glamoured, gilded glory. They look like a performer awaiting an audience, elegantly spinning on their heel, hold out a hand to receive their companion, Lady Maja. She fits the part of the leading lady well, both of them looking impeccable even after being in a caravan for hours. Okay. So, it's everybody that made this trip, and supposedly they left before sunrise. But, the ambassador had time to go visit Popper's crown, talk with Eric and Rue, and then make it back to the castle. 
And that's the ambassador was in one of the West. Um, carriages. Time is, time is a soup. It's like a spider. The night that accompanies the Vitrine ambassador all but marches out of his vehicle with them in tow. Hard for me to pin down anything about them or what they're like. Right now, Haggard comes to mind. It clearly didn't fare so well on the journey. Lucian catches my attention and they toss me that now familiar grin. Glad to see you escape the clutches of boredom on our long venture. Did I? It sure doesn't feel like it. Fair enough. Regardless, I look forward to your performance in the joust. What a fine way to get someone's blood pumping. Well, one way. Whatever else could you be referring to, Lucian? I had a response lined up, but it swiftly dissipates. Did they just imply what I think they did? I hear an audible hub and can only assume that it came from Lydia because of the way Lucian laughed. Before I can ask for them to elaborate, Matt reels me in and puts a gutted hand over his heart and salutes. Forgive me, but I'm going to head to the tent. I need to oversee the readying of the weaponry and prepare your armor. Also, he leans forward and whispers harshly, his eyes narrowing. To make sure none of these competitive bastards snuck in any faulty lances. Ugh. For a moment, I forgot what kind of company we're in. You're right, we don't want any poppers taking the title. I still remember years ago, at a much larger event, when one of the heralded champions claimed that he had no idea they were tampered with. If they wish to partake, they can use real lances and use with dignity. Kind smile forms on his lips and he listens to fingers, standing quiet and patient, so I know what he's really thinking. Exactly, my liege. As Matt makes his escape, I spot Masha and Lucian, throwing a polite wave for Olivia and I before moving to their viewing seats. With just Olivia and I left standing here, I'm more hyper aware of her presence than ever before, especially with her back to her tacky turn spouse. So, um, speaking of um, messing with lances. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with Tamora Pierce, but her, um, the four tall, uh, books. Um, the first quartet is about a woman who dresses as a man to become a knight. The second series of books can't remember which one came first, um, but like there's, it's made up of a series of quartets or a series of series, basically. And each series within the overall universe focuses mainly on a female character or female presenting character. And uh, one of them is about a woman who takes advantage of the ban listed on women being knights, and she um, goes through the knight training as a woman. And during that, um, the some of the other knights actually messed with her lances and um, made them heavier. So it got to the point where she was so used to it that when the when they stopped messing with the lances, they needed to weigh them because she's used to having a heavier lance. So, I, we will find out a bit more about messing with glances in a bit. The soldier clad in black steel, her expression just as hard as the armor that encases her. So, that shell cracks for a fraction of a second when she catches me staring, again. Is this one thing to say? I shake my head, I do and don't. My head is a mess and I feel like I'm trying to solve a puzzle composed of jumbled, bleeding thoughts. I, it might be a bit bored of me to say, but it was nice to see you like that. Like what, exactly? If you'll allow me to be frank, you looked happy. The words roll off my tongue with ease. I'm only being honest, and it truly was a pleasure to see her so relaxed. It suits her, and it'd be nice to see it more often. I can tell Savigny brings you a lot of joy, and you were just smiling a lot when he arrived. I know recent events have been troubling us all, but you most of all. You've been watching me rather closely, it would appear. How could I not? For all the scrambling I did earlier, but this time my mouth is far quicker than my brain. Who <laughs> brain mouth shit. Lydia's brows snap up for a moment and her mouth twitches at the corners. I can see her struggling to make sense of what I've just said. And I like to look at her. It just makes me happy to see you happy. That's happy. She averts her days, a blush kissing her cheeks. I I appreciate that. Few things give me joy as much as Sydney does. He takes my mind off matters, and it is, com it is a comfort to have around. 
thinking about a breach in our security is a plague on my mind, so... Good. I think we get this CG in all three routes. This time when Lydia smiles, it's not a sibling me, and nor is it sarcastic or dripping with disdain. No, this smile is for me. The sky blue eyes hold my gaze, warmer than I've ever seen them. The thought that you're concerned for my well-being is a comfort. You may think yourself to be well-versed in subterfuge, but I paid notice to your other inquiries. Uh-oh. <laughs> You have? I hope you don't see me at fault for being worried about your safety. My safety now, is it? Your tune has changed. I thought you would say our. I'm really destroying all my cards now. She chuckled. Something endearing about the way her eyes crinkle at the corners. Your commitment is appreciated, even though I'm the one who aims to protect you as your commander. All of you. I don't advise you to further your quest, because I will find our assassin. There's no question about it. I don't miss the way she scrambles to correct herself and saying to all of you when she just implied she may very well be as concerned for my individual safety as I am for hers. Aww. Anyway, I take up too much of your time today already. Your squire awaits you. I can't say that I mind you taking up my time. Yes, well, Mike Kadir, another time and place, maybe? That sure doesn't sound like a no to me, and it takes a lot of restraint to hide my smile. Of course, Knight Commander. My hand meets my breast and salute. Oh, and she offers me a devious look, her lips curling into a smile that breaks my effort to keep mine at bay. Like the bastard. I laugh. Yes, my lady. We part ways to go up to our respective areas, myself to the night's tent and Libya to be seated with the other spectators from the tent. She's a force to be reckoned with. I can imagine that they would not want to douse her. She would probably wipe the floor with everybody. Here we go. Vivian informed us on the way here that she wouldn't be taking part in the job, but claimed that it simply doesn't interest her. I don't think that any of the combatants would, could put up much of a fight against her, to be honest. So it's probably for the best. We can't go making it too easy for them. That, and she's also heard whispers that some knights refused to attend if she was a participant. Something about it being unfair. As I walk to the colorful line of tents, I take in the view of the ground, noticing that it's rather modest in its presentation, because these events usually go. There are a distant number of spectators, though, certainly more than I would have expected for such a lazy display. It's certainly easy to stop those from notice among the, the crowd, as well as other caravans decorated in my own Citrian colors. There's a clear divide of who actually offers their services to the kingdoms in attendance, as opposed to those who are clearly just here to show off in all their perfumed finery. As I draw nearer to my tent, it sounds almost like a fight has broken out inside, like a carpeting of scattering wood and steel loud enough to draw the attention of myself and those around me. My concern peaks and then swiftly trusts as I part the curtain and find Matt's red face and breaking lashes over his knee. He's cursing feminently, not even registering my presence. I remember him saying he was going to check the integrity of the weapons to sniff out potential bugs, so I'm pretty sure he's just breaking everything. I'm honestly surprised to see him offering such a passionate display. He seems so timid. Did you find some special weapons? His head snaps up, his eyes wide, but plays over like I've caught a beast feeding upon its prey. I raise my brow and await his response, trying not to laugh. Maddox. Okay, I knew it. I just knew that some of these insufferable factors would try this again. Trying this motherless, no life deserve me. Well, while you wait for no life to do that, please, will you, will you try and preserve some of those answers? I require at least one to be kept intact if I want to win. He exhales sharply, his shoulders sagging as his frustration dissipates a little. So the way he's gripping the lance he still has in his clutches is a little concerning, as are the curses still falling from his mouth, and in a dialogue I don't quite understand, too. I apologize, my leash. I know it's a mess in here, but I have spread you a weapon. The balance is excellent, very even, and the wood is strong, too. A testament to the weaponsmith who clearly cares about what they do. I made sure I pulled it aside from the others to make sure no one else claims it. I'm shocked there's that many knights who don't play well with others. They don't even win a bloody prize. The prize is bragging rights. Doesn't matter if they're one in fairness or not. They could care less about hard work. That might be true, but don't let them get under your skin. The job still has to determine whether a knight is worthy or not. Does it not? Um, are we gonna go to the 
Medica or the honorable route? We are a knight, so honorable route. Think about it, Maddox. I know you're angry, but how many stories are passed down that celebrate a knight for their jousting skills? We're not trying to make history here. The tales of heroism and bravery are from those who notice genuine good deeds and service, not whoever boasts the loudest and hits the hardest at a soft soul battle. That is true, it's just such a slip in a thin line, some more of that agitation fading away. I can see defeat rising in the set of his shoulders. I've seen so many jousts at this point, and rarely do I partake in them, even less now that I'm a little older. It's embarrassing to feel so alone and wanting to be a true knight. I see so many nobles donning the arbor and armor and rarely following the code of knighthood. The last true knight I knew was Sir Eric, and I know what they say about him, but it's all a bloody lie. I know in my heart what kind of man he truly is, and I refuse to believe he would deviate from that. Then his voice drops to almost a whisper, like he's sharing his secrets. The Knight Commander, too. She won't tell you, but I saw how devastated she was. They were close before, so much that his discharge changed her irrevocably. We're surrounded by pretenders, suffocating. This is both surprising and new to me, especially the part where Livia was apparently affected by Sir Archie's head trip. My heart goes out to Mads, too. The frustration feeling like you're being passed over in favor of those with finer blood and hefty titles is humiliating and demeaning. I reach out and place a reassuring hand upon his shoulder. I promise it won't always be this way. I know you have the makings of a great night. Your time will come, and I'll do my best to vouch for you. Don't lose faith. His gaze is soft and searching my own, really hoping that my words will hold true. Smiles and places a hand upon mine. I appreciate that more than you could know. May we be the change to the kingdom that drives it forward. Mads makes incredibly quick work of strapping on my armor, as always, his fingers step from doing this countless times. Did you get a good look at my competition? I haven't seen the master myself, but I hear that he frequents these jousts as often as possible. Sounds like the theatrical type. Theatrical? He nods, giving his work a once over, testing the shots and fastening. You might know know him, Sir Roland of Victor. He apparently promises he'll be the next night given to Novus. Those are unmatched, or so he says. A few have vouched for him. I can't say for certain that those claims hold any truth. I can't say that I recognize that name, but maybe seeing his face will jog my memory. Man shrugs and gets his final approval, shaking my shoulder gently. We're all set. You can head to the grounds now. They'll probably start as soon as you're both present. I ready your horse and land. I give him a grateful nod. See you out there. The crowd outside is buzzing, a low murmur of chatter and shuffling of feet. Anticipation rolls off of them in waves, peaking as soon as they spot me exiting the tent. There's a round of applause and some inelegant hollering, but the volume of their enthusiasm is surprisingly encouraging. So I soon come to realize that the lightest voice isn't from a stand, but from a certain Sir Roland. His gauntlet is raised sky- by the sky with any yells, looking to the viewers. They respond in kind to his bellowing, so they're still not nearly as reckless as him. Identify Masha, Lucian, Livia, and the Vizian ambassador sitting close together and looking decidedly unimpressed. Livia catches my eye, and even from here I can see the sharp incline of her brow. She rises and holds up her own fist, and the crowd falls silent within the blink of an eye. Now that's how you command an audience. The Roland's jaw snaps shut. There's a visible standoff between him and Livia, her gaze demanding his obedience. He shrinks like a scolded warhound. I don't miss the satisfied way in which her lips were twist at the sight of it. Esteemed guests, I welcome you here today to take part in our event, a diversion of good faith between allies and comrades. We hope that you are all in good health and that our coming together provides you with the assurance that our friendship is everlasting. Please welcome our combatants to the field, Knight Cadet Kadir of Novus and Knight Voland of Victor. Applause rings out once again, but this time the audience shows considerable restraint. The rules are simple. Strike true at your opponent and unseat them from their horse. Should their lance shatter by your own shield, by your own shield, then the same with when condition applies. If your whole horse falls with you and you still manage to knock your opponent off of theirs, then the wind falls to you. As Olivia speaks, her golden squire approaches with his speed and weapon in hand. The young woman has an impressive lance and an ornate shield into his hand. Lastly, there will be no bloodshed. The terms of the doubts will not result in slaughter. We didn't kill our allies during a show of togetherness. I hear the sound of hooves 
and turned to find Madge approaching with my mouth. Yes, he's changed, no longer sporting his armor, which is odd. I glare at him, but Livia snatches my attention. With the rules clear, combatants, ready yourselves. I mount my horse with grace. It's beautifully a beautifully sleek, white, and well-managed steed with a well-crafted black saddle. Madge then holds up my lance and shield, a hood pulled over his head as he wordlessly hands it over, steps away a little too fast for my liking. Something isn't right. Mad? The sudden muteness and refusal to look me in the eye is bizarre, but I'm assured when I feel the bounce weight of the lance in my grip. Yet, as he said, it's a remarkable weapon for such a meaningless sport. You weren't kidding when you said you found a good one. I'm glad it pleases you. Why is that question mark? I pause. Mads finally looks at me from underneath his cowl, a shock of white hair and blood spread fiery red, and a cheeky grin instead of his soft one. Hey, hey, then, uh, good luck out there, you have. Raiden winks and takes everything, it uh, takes everything in me not to lash out that shit at green that makes my blood pressure spike. What the hell are you doing here? Like Kadir! As much as I want to reach out and snatch Raiden by the scruff of his neck, I can do nothing but watch they slip away. What reason would he even have to be here? So I suppose a snake like him needs little reason to do anything that will cause trouble. Receiving words of comfort from your squire, you'll need them if your skills are as lacking as I remember. I hear quiet laughter in the stands. He's trying to goad me and have me snap, but all I think about is that I have no idea who the hell he is. I'm not a loss, I'm afraid. You say you've seen my skills before? I call out to him with obvious uncertainty in my voice. He barks the laugh, all two, all two white teeth and gusto. Truly, you feign ignorance now? Oh, how my bitter rival is quick to forget me. Rival? I try not to tilt my head and make my ignorance obvious. Theatrical sure is the right word for him. Okay. Be honest or be honorable. That's the more tactful option. It's just to pretend. You'll have to forgive me, sir. It's not often I remember everyone that calls me their rival. So your boisterous attitude has jogged my memory. Though your memory may not be as sharp as you think, I don't even remember you besting me. May your defeat today be graceful. I nudge my horse forward so he can clearly see the graciousness I offer him. The self-satisfied smile he had quickly sours into a grimace. That was actually pretty clever. The iron is gauge is palpable. He looks like he's trying to melt me with that alone. I'm honestly surprised my words struck a chord. I was nearly giving as good as I was getting. He aggressively knocks on his helmet, the front plate to the iron shut, and he yanks on the horse's reins to pull it into his starting position. I have no need for grace and defeat. It's you who will fall today. Finally, we ready ourselves, and Livia looks upon us from the stands, giving a curt nod. Come on! With a click of my tongue and the heels of my boots pressing into the sides of my mount, we dart forward. So do we defend or attack? Pull out a handy dandy dice. So, I have a d6, and odd numbers will defend, even numbers will attack. It's five. So, defend. Roland approaches with good speed, his lance poised and at the ready, aiming to meet its mark. I bring my shield close, a fortress held firm in front of my body. If I'm lucky, he'll aim for it to try and knock me off, and I'll simply catch him up kilter. The clash and his blow clatters against my shield, the weight of his lance heavy, but I managed to deflect it with my strong defense. The rolling rocks in the saddle, but keeps himself mounted. I barely catch his frustrated grunt and pass him when we exchange sides. This competition will be over fairly soon if he remains this emotional. We make another pass at each other and he pulls puts all of his weight into his momentum. He's relying on the strength he puts behind his lance to overpower me, but his concentration is lacking. If I play this right, I can end this now. By making his target my shield on the second and third pass, the integrity of his lens must be dulling by now. With the precise strike to the pole, I'm positive I can shatter it. The renewed intensity in his posture tells me he's determined to end this now, too, which will make this even easier than I had anticipated. I meet his speed gallop for gallop as he closes the gap between us and, once again, predictably, he ends for my shield like a painted target. I put all my weight behind it and angle the center to meet the end of his spear, my own lance turned at just the right angle that he needs to move a crucial inch to the left. He cries out as if hollering while I'm power to stress. When I feel the collision, I smile. Sir Roland did his best, but his best is into the nest. I can see the whites of his wide eyes through his visor just before he tumbles, a whirlwind of armored limbs as he scrambles to stay saddled. 
So the desperate scrambling doesn't save him, and he collapses in the dirt with a clank and a heavy thud. The steed eagerly untangles itself from him with a grunt and leaves him in its literal depth. The crowd booms with applause, and even Mash is that Lydia standing and smiling, her quack loud and enthusiastic. The rolling groans and rolls side to side, trying to get off his back like an overturned turtle. His visor snaps open, and he's panting, dirt covered, red faced mess. Glances at the crowd with a wounded look before finally reluctantly meeting my gaze. I half expected him to go down like a squealing bait, but instead there's a pause, then a tight lip nod, and he finally concedes defeat. Maybe he has an ounce of grace after all. Maybe. I wonder if we'll see him again. We have him so far. Of course, he's from Bitfus and we're in Novus, so. There's barely a moment of freedom when I finally leave the arena. I eagerly return to casual dress, and I'm sworn the moment I exit. Eventually, I stopped Maja looking rather restless in her seat, seeing that as the perfect excuse to tear myself away from this buzzing crowd. Of course. You're a winner now where everybody wants to talk to you. I apologize profusely while edging away little by little, finally escaping into freedom. Maja stops and puts a delicate hand over her mouth to hide her laughter, albeit squirrely. That was an excellent display of prowess he had. His ego is tender and bruised. Slide into the seat next to her and exhale, finally relaxing, or as much as you can relax in the presence of the Grand Archmage. It was difficult to avoid wounding it with how large it is. <laughs> Indeed. But very true. So many people come here looking to impress the crowd that it ends up turning into a play with foolish gestures running about. It would, I'm surprised to see you here. I didn't think you'd watch what then there's the mindless event like this. She sighs, her gaze far into the side. Her fingers seek something to do, smoothing down the perfect fit fabric of her dress. I wouldn't say it was mindless. I mean, think about what went into unseating their opponent. They had to strategize, they had to think about how to make use of their opponent's um, methods of attack. And then use that against them. So you analyze the attack, you figure out a way to use that to your advantage, and you implement this plan that you came up with, and you win. That's not mindless. I don't want to know Lucian was the one to propose the idea. It been feeling restless and bored all cooped up in the past walls, as have I. It's good fun for them, but I don't tend to enjoy the inherent barbarism and theatrics of the chess. To which I will apologize, I was not present for most of your performance. My attention was drawn by another individual, one I had to keep a close eye on. Someone causing trouble? She hums, deciding how best to respond, I assume. Trouble is a broad word, but really nothing truly worries him. I just had to personally make sure that certain characters were behaving themselves. And, of course, partner with everybody, so third adoption we go. Is trouble what it takes to earn the gaze of Lady Masha? There's a hint of surprise that crosses her face for a brief moment before she recognizes my meaning. Are you looking to cause a thing to capture my attention, Ehab? I don't encourage resorting to unsavory methods. I won't give you any grief, my lady. I just look forward to figuring out how to get some of your time to myself. I watch how her expression turns into something curious as she sews back in her seat really more relaxed than she was before. My time and attention is afforded to those who earn it. Thought she can come up with more graceful and creative means to achieve that. I look forward to seeing you try. There's a playful challenge in her voice and an open invitation to win her affection. It draws me closer, close enough so that no one would, could dare to call it a scandal, but the energy that burns between us is palpable and exhilarating. I'll do my best. Who are you? I'm so thankful for Maja's presence, though I'm not certain about how much longer we'll be able to remain here enjoying this reprieve. I certainly don't plan on watching any other entrance, and part of me wants to ask Olivia how long this whole thing will stretch on for. I seek her out in the crowd and find her occupied with someone I don't recognize and try not to deflate in my seat, but Masha has a keen eye and catches it immediately. Not much longer, I hope, for all the whining from the other courtiers that appear at this event is that they are making themselves scarce, so it's another nice diversion at the very least. Is it for you, though? Well, no, not particularly. She 
brings her hands together and rests with gesture. She quickly stops when she registers what she's doing. She sighs heavily, doing her best to offer me a smile. It's been some time since there's been any kind of upheaval within the past. And even then, it is, it, even then, it resolved within almost a fortnight. It's entirely possible my worries are for not, but it's different this time. No words come out, but, but she nods gravely. No news is typically good news, but the complete absence of any has me wary. I have no information to work with, almost as though the event never even came to pass. Livia has worked tirelessly to ensure nothing ill befalls us, and I trust her, but I can't shrug off this feeling, like a bad omen hanging over it. A bad omen. Those words echo in my mind. I wasn't sure what to make of it before, but she put it into words perfectly. Her hand moves over her heart, a look of apology in her eyes. I apologize. I didn't mean to make you worry more. I spoke my mind too freely. My only wish is to be able to help. Ironic that I tell Olivia not to worry, and then I have Lucian telling me I do the very thing. Of course. They're likely right, but it's commendable that you care as much as you do. So speaking of the Ambassador, where might they be? I haven't seen them since the start. Lucian has excused himself to wander around. They did mention finding their own entertainment. Whatever that might mean, feel free to find out. I'm sure they haven't gone far. That sounds just like someone else I know. I'm not I'm sorry for the abrupt break in conversation, but just remember there's someone I need to find. Masha smiles is patient and kind as always when she shakes her head. No need to apologize. I hope you're able to find them in this crowd, and you try to enjoy yourself. Her eyes crinkle with little corners, and I can't help but smile back as I bid her farewell. I step away from the stands and search the outskirts of the arena. Particularly congested at the other end of the seating area, nobles rubbing elbows and laughing obnoxiously enough to catch flies. I don't think even Raven would try to pretend to be one of them. Maybe looking for Lucian will help me find him. They're practically attached by the hip. Mmm, now there's an image. Or literally, sometimes. That's exactly where my brain went. I try to search for that tall, unmistakable silhouette, but the nobles on this crowd are making it hard for me to distinguish shimmering gold robes from slightly fancier shimmering gold robes. No use, I can't bloody spot them. At the very moment I think that, I see someone deviate from the crowd, heading somewhere behind the tent. I'm certain I found my target, and I trail them with a wide berth. I keep a steady stride, circling around again before disappearing into the trees that line the edge of the arena. I'm positive it's him. Pick up my pace and follow him. Doubtful anyone will know so even care enough to wonder what I'm up to. The gent is chosen as far removed from everything else. He went around the corner and not surprised to see him lying against a tree, but familiar and inferior yet to me, doubles and grins, flash across his face. So, you found me! You weren't exactly being discreet. His grin widens and his shoulders roll in a careless shrug. I was just trying to be helpful. I'm not exactly sure how good your tracking skills are. I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about that stunt you pulled earlier, parading as my square in front of a huge crowd. Again, I was trying to be helpful. I take a deep breath before I even attempt to process my thoughts, while also trying desperately not to look at its smug face. He leans forward and tilts his head, grin widening. You were all right there? You look a little flushed. Right as lame, thank you. What they say about the members of his guild being a fairy serpent could have been more accurate, slithering around, biting me in the ass. Why are you here? And in broad daylight, too. I'm not afraid someone will recognize you. Raiden jerks his head back quick, almost like he's got a, got a whiff of something foul, his lips curling over his teeth. Wow, you can at least give me some kind of credit. I wouldn't be the best in my guild if I was sloppy enough to get caught in a fancy camp event like this. How do I know that's not a self proclaimed title? He gets star fingertips, fingertip to his lips to shush me. Didn't Lucy already tell you that they vouched for me? I think just any old or young and very handsome assassin gets a fake referral from a demon like them. Like, <clears throat> they put it like that. No, I can't imagine a demon like Lucian ever convincing me of an assassin's abilities unless it was part of some bigger scheme. So neither did I imagine I would ever speak to a demon like Lucian on a regular basis. This is true. Point taken. 
they wanted you, if they wanted to catch me, they could have done it. All the other nights I hang out in the past. Hmm, you could have too. Zip's purse and he stops for a minute to think deep thoughts. Regardless, I know you can't and won't ever catch me, Ehab. And what makes you sound so sure? Jaden pushes off of the tree and raises his hands in surrender, fingers wiggling. You can't arrest an unarmed man who hasn't done anything. I sneer right at him when he says unarmed. You're never unarmed. Mm, it would be terribly stupid of an assassin to wander around without at least one tool. He drops his hands and begins to pace, and I can feel a speech coming on. So you really don't have a reason to take me in, do you? I haven't done anything wrong, ever, in my life. At worst, my crime is trespassing, and as much as that ice cream wants to beat my ass, it's no skin off my nose to sleep in a shitty dungeon for a few days. Which isn't all that terrible when you think about it. Have you ever slept in the den of a dragon, for example? I have, and you never sleep as still as that. Like you're dead, basically. Aside from all that, if I have you pegged, you look like the type that couldn't stomach trying in someone without a just reason. It wouldn't be right. He tries to stuff his hands into his pockets, moving back to lounge against a tree with an impish smile. The smile that says me he says he has me all figured out. So my goal is it wouldn't be right, and then neither is I'm buying my time. Or we go with the flare action. Uh, if I, um, generally when I'm having a specific in mind that I'm going to romance, I don't flirt with the other characters. But since this is a playthrough, I'm flirting with everybody, so we're going to go with the third option. It's aggravating, this game of cat and mouse we play. When he beckons, I follow, and while it's my duty to keep an eye on him, part of me can't help but easily fall captive to his challenge for other reasons. When I look at him now, all I can think is when the hell did I start to be of him as handsome? A dangerous question for someone in my position to ask, maybe, but even more dangerous for me to admit to myself that I rather enjoy looking at him. Don't look so, so smug. You know you're right. I won't turn someone in for empty reasons. No need to be cute about it. So you think I'm cute, huh? Hmm? I... Yes. Yeah. Don't trust my words, Snake. You know exactly what I mean. Clearly, I need to watch my mouth around him lest I stumble and give him more fuel for his flirtatious fire. He's grown so wide now that I can see dimples in his cheeks that I certainly haven't noticed before. Am I really twisting your words, though? Does it make, does it truly frighten you that a knight finds a terrible assassin cute? You wound me, and besides, I was the first one to say that I think you're cute. You don't remember such a thing. You don't remember, Ehab. It was the first night we met. That hurt. I was looking pretty handsome at the market, too. That must have been hard for you to forget. You don't typically forget a face like mine, not if you have eyes. Before I can even make sense of what I'm doing, I'm already closing in on him, crowding him against the tree. He doesn't even flinch, and that one bit just relaxes against the trunk and rolls with it. This man is far too aware of himself, his dark eyes staring at me like he's trying to burn right through my skull. His shapely lips parting a fraction as a low, husky chuckle rolls off his tongue. Your face is hard to forget, but you're playing a dangerous game trying to flirt with me. It's only dangerous if it's working, Ehab. This energy that envelopes both of us threatens to strangle me. He still stares, daring me to look away, poking and prodding at me with just a look as he rests the give. Rest. I think that's supposed to be test. Test the give of my willpower. I want to do something, so I step away before a coherent thought can give us and that something ends up being stupid. Behave yourself, Raiden. Make me. I put exactly one finger up, telling him to silence himself, and he chuckles like a boy who just told the most inappropriate joke. Good. Which isn't ag- actually all that far from the truth. This man is a bastard. I can hear soft footsteps approaching, and I am and suddenly acutely aware of what company I'm keeping. My back straightens and I glare at Raiden and wordlessly tell him to stay put. He quirks a brow at me as if he's ready to defy my request, but he obeys, thankfully. Then a familiar smooth voice greets out. Nice to see you again, Ahab. Congratulations on your spectacular win. My favorite part was the speech beforehand, though. They're handsomely glamoured once again, and it's hard to look away as they approach. He place a hand over their breasts and bow. I'm glad you were entertained. To say it was an awkward exchange would be an understatement. I could tell. The light of the sun illuminated your confusion rather well. I grimaced. I tried not to be too obvious. 
I wouldn't worry about that. And certainly more people will have the image of Sir Roland rolling in the dirt on their minds for some time. But here in an exasperated house from Raiden, his posture less self assured than it was before Lucian came. He looked antsy, wiggly. Oh, wiggly. Lucian inclines their head towards him. Did you have something to say? Took you long enough to get here, Lucy. I know you made me wait on purpose. They stop quietly and Raiden pats for a brief second before shrugging, pretending he isn't throwing a straw. Pressing matters had me otherwise occupied. Besides, it's not like you couldn't have entertained yourself, like you always do. You know how things work, little snake. Little snake. You could hold one of a, one of these stupid events whenever you please. I don't think you would have missed out on much. And should I assume you knew everything that I get up to? I know you're terribly curious, but my hands aren't idle just because they aren't upon you. That is a lovely turn of phrase. Lucian is clacking their fangs when they're glaring, but their smile packs just as much of a bite, and Raiden shrieks from drink in its effects. So, what were you up to? Mingling. Or rather, drifting from person to person and learning what we spoke to decide to share with me. Events like these make it far too easy to learn information that should be held close. The allure of casual in the description translates to laziness. And here I thought you held this because you were bored. I am, though it was still a methodical decision. I just needed a time and place to arrange all of them together. Two birds with one stone, you might say. A few other like-minded individuals are doing just the same. You might have met them or dimly have heard of them in passing. Marsha's brother? I feel a glance at Raiden and he rolls his eyes, his dark brains, the dark brains drawn together. Please don't act like you think I don't already know about this. Lucian shoots him a withering look. Our friend here is trying to have some tact. You should be mindful of the same. Raiden sighs, making a show of being defiant, but he refrains from pressing the issue too far. I doubt Nazir would bring harm to anyone here, but that doesn't mean he's incapable of that. Far from it. Yet my point remains that in a crowd of most of fools, there are still some powerful, useful individuals here. I haven't forgotten your search for answers either. If you plan on investigating here, then please tread carefully. I hope Raiden was able to glean something of interest for you. Something like that. I told you what I could, and some of your questions are things I can't safely answer. Namely for you. You mean all the dodging and teasing were this to protect me? Some of it. Other bits were just fun. A bit of that cocky attitude comes back to the surface, and now it's my time. And it's, now it's my time now to draw my eyes. I have to too many knives. Regardless, I don't think you'll find the answers you're looking for here. What makes you think to say that? From the sound of it, it seems like you did gain something today. Raiden taps tra- the base of the tree with his foot, still looking miss, like he's finally at his limit. So, are you going to share with the class what you spent all your time on? Lucian glowers at me, but not directly at me, but rather a mutually shared disdain for our whining companion. You're impatient today, aren't you? They approach Raiden in such a way that it's hard to register that they're still glamorous. Even when I can clearly see they are, they're still much like that familiar demon, sneaking, stalking closer to him like he's captured prey. And there's an image. They reach out and drag a knuckle from his throat to the edge of his jaw before pulling away. I can see how Raiden chases the touch when it leaves his skin, and Lucian does a good job of charming the snake. They lean in close to his ear and pause as if they're about to whisper something. I almost want to avert my eyes, but Raiden's face tells me I have nothing to shy away from. He looks perplexed, but still matches it with a smile. Very. I think this is the first CG with the two of them together. I'm sorry, Ehab. Can I ask? I ask that you give us some time alone. I must speak to him in private. Raiden has lost all of his cockiness. Something like apprehension came to his features instead. I wonder what they said to him that I can't hear. You still haven't told me why I wouldn't get answers. Mm, yes, that. It's just the kind of questions that you have in mind will give you the information you seek. That still doesn't explain much. They sigh and rest a hand upon my shoulder, guiding me back towards the tent. Walk with me. Let us pretend we're spending time together, a talk t- taking in the sights. It'll be a nice testimony to your presence here. It's a sensible choice. And of course, word. So, maybe because we're so close together, I feel emboldened. Lucian's easy confidence and grace is like an aura 
This would be an inherent trait of being a demon, but to move through the world as though it's how it's always been. Everything that was close glances in their orbit, a siren sun pulling them close. I moved myself from their hand and they watched curiously when I side my arm through theirs instead, thinking us together. Do we have to pretend? I think it would be a more convincing story if we believed it ourselves. Their eyes followed the line that glides from our linked arms up to my face in a slow drag. Their stormy eyes gave me a long once over. And then and we then continue arm in arm with purpose. An excellent point. Strategically sound, and it's kind of a well deserved fun for us. So this thing comes closer to my ear, so close I can feel the breath go over my skin like a caress. Such a simple gesture, but the intensity of it is so much more palpable with the eyes of so many strangers upon it. Once this is done, I would rather enjoy it if we could have time to ourselves somewhere in night. Away from Patty Night. Their words are full of promise and the affectionate smile they offer me when they pull back, plus the string in my heart. We circle around the grounds, all eyes upon us as we pass, occasionally being stopped by onlookers, though some are hesitant to approach us for fear of imposing or even just coming close. Demons will do that, even if they are glamorous. Our conversations are polite and reserved, just about as tragic as I expected from the kind of people in an attendance, and yet there's an undeniable feeling of restraint. There's a fear of asking too many questions, questions that may come up controversial. In all honesty, the feeling is pretty powerful. There's no doubt that anyone would bother to question our attendance after the festivities now. We glide from group to group, leaving them in suspense each time we depart. The small familiar touches and knowing looks exchanged between us beg the question they all ask. When did the night and ambassador become so close? It may have been staged for show initially, the loose touch lingers as we head back for the floor. That was entertaining, not quite what I expected, but I wouldn't mind doing it again. It was, wasn't it? I have a few other ideas to turn their heads, but those might be better reserved for another time. I did mention that I'd like to spend more time with you elsewhere, though. If you have me, that is. It depends. Where would you take me? Their lips form that familiar, devious smile, and I can almost imagine their fangs pressing over their bottom lip. With a delicate touch, they take my hand in theirs as they bow, striking eyes peering up at me through long lashes. Wherever you wish, fair knight. Their touch lingers for what feels like forever and press upon my skin like a brand. Give it some thought. I'll try and do my best to meet your expectations. Until then, try to enjoy the rest of the event. Lucian's eyes glitter with mischief as we part. After a few, more than a few handshakes, meaningless conversations, and ass kissing, the event comes to a long way to close. I just love how Lucian is able to play Raiden so easily. Of course, they've had plenty of practice. Um, actually, I don't know if it's indicated how long Lucian and Raiden have been a thing. But, yeah, you can tell that Lucian knows exactly how to push Raiden's button. <clears throat> we finally pile into the carriages with the same group that we arrived with, but all decorum and etiquette are scattered to the wind. We're all fucking exhausted. To my surprise, Olivia congratulates me on the ride back. She looks incredibly weary and subdued, yet her words of praise are honest. How she delivers them differs from her usual tone, something a little softer around the edges. I think her little exchange earlier in the day has affected her. Her mindfulness coaxes those curious feelings to the surface again. Feelings that stay with me for the rest of the journey as I watch her blue eyes slowly close. Eventually fatigue settles in and I get some well-deserved rest for the remainder of the journey. Without being my brother, my brother falls asleep so easily in cars. But I, I find it difficult to fall asleep just anywhere. Some people do. I can't. I don't like falling asleep around in any sort of public setting. Cars only if I'm super exhausted. I thought I would quickly head back to my quarters and turn in for the night after the event, but here I am, wandering the streets of Novus aimlessly. Something called me here, the desire to clear my head of all the palace pageantry, maybe, or maybe just to feel normal for a little while. Dealing with that many perfumed wigs and blinding gaudiness makes me glad I'm just a knight. The kind of mental fortitude Maja must possess is remarkable. 
and the razor sharp gaze will be aware is like a shield is more understandable than ever. How people can laugh about finding about nothing and gloat in circles is beyond me. What I do know is that there's far too much res- restless energy left in me to allow me to sleep, and so here I am. No one questions me here, at least, not while I shuffle around taking in the sights. Streets are quiet, the people few in number, and the sky is a clear expanse of stars. Thanks, no with some small blessings. So, maybe for just daring to hatch a thoughts, I'm rewarded by the sound of barrels falling over, the noise followed by a string of colorful curses and a gruff voice. I immediately tense up that knee-jerk reaction so ingrained in me to react to trouble putting me into action. Doesn't sound like a fight, and I'm pretty sure it's probably nothing, but no, I shouldn't check. I don't need to. Could have just been a cat. Another cry of wood breaking, and now my instincts are begging me to look. Okay, my voice is starting to wear out. It's almost done. Fuck. Around the corner, and all I can think of is how I'd love to say no for once in my life. I left my gaze and find the large silhouette of a very recognizable man. The sign above his head reads the pauper's crown. Go figure. No, oh, it's you. Hello, Eric. Is that a bad thing? The light here is poor, but there's an obvious flush on his cheeks and the distinct stench of booze in the air. Eric leans against the building, squinting at me, almost an angry look, but then turns away with a broken laugh. I don't know anymore. I then guessed her at the knocked over barrels, which I assumed was his doing. I thought there might have been some trouble. You would come running when you hear trouble, wouldn't you? Typical night bullshit. And you're right, I am trouble. I wasn't exactly running. Also, as far as I'm concerned, you're not trouble. You're just drunk. Eric barks another lie. They should have made you a, an investigator. You're good at noticing things. Thanks, I guess. Those honey eyes look me up and down, probably wondering why I'm here, but not shrouded in armor. Just out for a walk? Kind of. I needed some air. Huh, <laughs> same. Long day? Yeah. I know that look. Some nobility bullshit at pals, the kind of crap they should pay you more for? Am I right? I give him a nod. Nailed it. Of course, they turn you to be a knight, a protector, but then they don't tell you that some days you're dragged along to be some glorified guard dog. I know just how much he's been talking for once. Before it was like pulling teeth. Perhaps it's a drink that makes his tongue loose. I figure I might as well stay for a bit, because having a real conversation with Eric is a rare and almost precious thing. He seems to know the man and so the myth. One of the barrels hasn't been kicked away or knocked over and makes for a decent seat beside him, so I perch myself upon its edge. So what brings you out here tonight, aside from the booze? The scarred hand carts his long burnished hair, his leather streaking when he shrugs. Well, the plan was to just get lost in the swell, but a persistent acquaintance decides to stop by. Every time they come around, they always have to drill me about something. Hmm. Who could this acquaintance be? Just do a lot more talking than drinking tonight. Keep talking. He grimaces. They finally left me alone, and now you're here. I have no idea why any of you keep wanting to talk to me. Does that bother you? He shakes his head. I just want to know why anyone would want to be around someone like me. The volume in his voice drops off, words wavering before it grows quiet. It's just sad. So, obviously we're going with the third option. A tight knot burns in my chest, hearing him say that. I can't imagine it would compare to the one in his heart. I drift a little closer, something pulling me in. I don't think I've told you this before, but I really do think you're a good man. He has a dubious laugh. His face forlorn is still painfully pretty. I'm not sure why you're telling me that. You want to know why someone would want to be around you, and I just told you. There are plenty of good men out there. Well, maybe the other part of my answer is a bit more selfish than mine. Make sure he's looking at me before I continue. I want him to see the honesty in my eyes, or I don't know if he'll believe me. I can't speak for everyone else, but I know what I want, and strangely, that's to be around you. That good enough answer for you? I see the bob of his Adam's apple as he swallows, his lips parting as if he's about to speak, but he refrains. His cheeks darken a little more, and he finally looks at me looks me dead in the eyes. Eric has tried to sell himself as being unapproachable, prickly, and unwilling to share anything, but I can still see the tenderness in him. I believe the tales of him being an honorable man, driven to tragedy, 
it's, it's there in everything he does, in his fond annoyance, in how he's conscious not to make trouble for others, and in how he worries about being good. I find myself drawn to that. It's not the one I expected, but it's good. Finally, a shy smile graces his features, and it's such a handsome sight. The pretty color that dusts his cheeks, worn by days in the sun, that warm amber gaze staring at me with a kind of fondness I didn't think I would receive. It's like a secret being shared between us, that smile that lights up his face, and in turn, mine too. I won't soon forget it. Now you got me thinking. Is it really an accident that you're here? An easy laugh escapes me. Let's call it a happy accident. I was simply shuffling through the streets to try and avoid my headache. And you didn't think that maybe I'd just make it worse? I did say happy accident. I guess that is. That you did. He rests his head back against the cool brick behind him, his gaze skyward, looking at the canopy of stars stretched out above us. It looks like just a little bit of his hope has been renewed. He eventually pushes off the wall with the hub, eyes drawn to the forest. You should probably head back now. It's getting late. Am I taking up your time? No, I mean the streets. They're not safe when it gets to sleep. You're worried about a night wandering novice in the dark. I mean, really. It's just smart to be aware, alright? His blush spreads to his ears, and I can't help but find the, his tact endearing. What about you? Your cabin is in the woods, and you're still out and drunk. Would it be the first time, and the thieves know not to mess with me? Hmm. I leave my barrel seat and nod to the tree line. I'm going straight back to the house, but only after I escort you home. Just go home already. I don't need a buddy escort. Are you kidding? I already begin walking off in the direction of the outer perimeter and tilt my head. What was that? You have to tell me to my face. Come on. I saw his eyebrows leaning together and hear a whisper to fuck. He lumbers behind and I grin, turning back to the path ahead. Getting there. So, as you probably guessed, uh, we have a theme with the Ghibli potential romance option. So there's one left after Eric. The woods at night are unnerving, almost like the shadows cast around us make things twisted, branches reaching out like twisted fingers ready to snatch unsuspecting wanderers. Mind your footing, I don't want to lose you to the brush. I wait for him to step over a gnarled root and he grimaces and grunts. I know my way around. Eric grumbles again and keeps up his pace. You sound like Liv. I assume he's referring to Livia, but imagining her way, letting anyone refer to her as that is weird. I don't think I've heard anyone else dare to call the Night Commander that. Because they shouldn't if they like their nose unbroken. I've called her that since she was a girl. And now she's all grown up and the bloody Night Commander. They had better do her right. This is beginning to sound a lot like another part of Eric's past he hasn't touched upon with me just yet. So, obviously we're not going to do the backstab option. Olivia is recognized for her service. She's one of the best knights I've ever seen. I know what nefarious monikers she's labeled with, and yes, she can be intimidating. But she's clearly a good person. The effort and care she puts into our order is why we move forward. I turn to see his reaction, and he looks... proud. I'm not surprised. Mm-hmm. Made it in one piece despite the creepy forest you live in asking for trouble. Eric sucks past me, but not before glancing in my direction. He approaches the door and his hand collides with the wood. It swings open and I realize now they didn't lock the door. He either doesn't think anyone will break in or he simply doesn't care. Well, thanks, I suppose. No need. I offered. I guess. There's a pregnant pause that falls, and I stand there looking like he's deciding on saying something, but doesn't. You going to be okay from here? Yeah. Then he's gone, disappearing into the dark. I wiggle the door handle, just checking it. Not locked, but at least it's closed properly this time. It's time now that I make good on my word and head back to my chambers, I suppose. So, peering back into the, that mess of sea limbs and darkness makes me wonder how I'll find my way back. Instinct and purpose, I hope. I think about retracing my steps, but I can hardly see my hand in front of my face, so that's all the question. This doesn't bode well for me, especially when I see a silhouette approaching, circling the trees. I can't quite make out what it is. It looks humanoid, but my hand reaches out, reaches to the small knife I keep on my belt, knuckles paling, blood and blade a notch out. 
Oh, no need for that. First job source, and I almost think it's talking. Um, hello? It shows again, and out pops through. I feel like I should have expected this. They bend over, flashing a smile full of sharp teeth. Their excitement and notable contrast to the, to the sinister setting that surrounds us. Hello again. Sorry to spook you. The woods have a mean face to come tonight. My knife being flush against his cheek, and I sigh, giving Rue a relieved smile. That they certainly do. It's a little bit of a dizzying experience with so little light. I heard from the wood that you helped Eric get home and that he was a bit sad. Is everything all right? I think he'll be fine, at least for now. I just hope that he made it to bed before he passed out. He's going to sleep on a lot of different things, but at least he's home now and I can check on him later. What about you? You look a touch lost. I give them a sheepish look. I walked him home with the confidence that I could find my way back. Hmm, distracted by a large ex knight? It happens. Something like that, but he was being stubborn too. He is very stub he is a very stubborn man. Not a button pusher like Ry. They can still work people up. They're similar in that way. I'm starting to see that now. The head tilts side to side, their tight curls bouncing. Just so happens that I'm not doing anything at the moment, so I can guide you home if you like, or at least into town. So if you plan on passing through again in the future, it might be a good idea to introduce you to the forest. Somehow it didn't occur to me that planning my way was difficult because I forgot such an important detail. Remember, they're half bay. And rubber zippers. I spent so much time behind the stone walls of the past that I'd forgotten the common courtesy of my brother. He totally slipped my that totally slipped my mind. I should both introduce myself and apologize too, shouldn't I? Oh, they're not angry. Keep a lot in your mind. You know that. I follow the path that began to lead me down. It looks far more open and obvious than the one I traveled. The forest slowly seems to come alive, the further Rue leads me in, overhanging and reaching branches, straightening, leaves rustling their welcome. It's truly a magical sight. I hope you don't mind the detour. It's easier if they get for them if they get a good look at you. I nod and let my fingers graze the ancient trees as we drift by, feeling the thrum of something akin to a beating pulse beneath my touch. It was almost oppressive before, like a foggy maze that could keep me here if it wished, but now it's gentle. You look so at home here. Rue touches the tree reverently, offering a coy smile before disappearing. A sliver of urgency rolls through me when they vanish, but I know Rue belongs here, and that they're probably messing with me. Yay. Rue is The problem is, I want to roll my phone all at once. Then room he emerges from the other side, their hand outstretched, a neat little ball of light hovering about their palm. A wide smile lights up their face as they watch it, wiggling their fingers as the light bounces off each digit. I am home here. I was once like them, one of these grand trees, but then I took this shape when I met a tiny boy called Graydon. I still like to be close to the forest, though. Always. I can see why. Magic drives out here, so much that's making my ears buzz. Possibly because you have a friend next to you. Sure enough, I look to my right, and one of the lights safely bounces off of me, far too animated to just be a magical illumination. You look like you'd be fine with getting lost out here. Possibly. We're not far from the city, but this place feels like a hidden little pocket, something peaceful away from the worries of the world. So, I was being a Z disagree or flirt. I was never going flirt. With everything that's happening in the kingdom and the streets of my res the stress of my responsibilities, the idea is more than tempting. Yet far more than that, the prospect of spending more time with Rue is the thing that lured me in. So much of them radiates happiness and wonder that I can only imagine the kind of sights we could see if stepping away from the palace was an option. If I get lost here, could I trust you to be my guide? I would be more than happy to if you ever get, what do they call it, a vacation? Nice guest vacations? I could show you some of my favorite places. I mirror their movements from earlier, circling the base of one of these giant trees, and they follow suit, stepping around the, op the opposite to mine. It feels like a dance. Tell me about them. 
I have no idea when I'll have the luxury of a reprieve from knighthood, so hearing it will simply have to suffice for now. But one of them is a two-hook grotto, littered with nightly that glow like the moon. The palace garden has some, but these are so special. That sounds like a dream. Ruth spins around another tree closer to mine, eyes lifted to the canopy above us. Even the leaves seem to glitter, like those tiny stars running through their veins. It's real, I promise. Sometimes you just need to know where to look to find beautiful things. I didn't look for you. You just found me. Their eyes tear away from the forest ceiling and look at me, their mouths hanging ajar. When they next speak, their voice is quiet, barely a whisper. That was a smooth one. You really think that about me? Of course I do. Their copper lashes dip and kiss the swell their cheekbones as they blink in almost disbelief, lips curling into a gentle smile. You're sweet. I hope I can show you these sights that speak of sometime soon. Me too. The time spent here surrounded by the comfort of the forest and roof has made this trek far less daunting and maybe even an adventure. Even with how much of a nightmare the day has been, had been to begin with, I'm so glad that this is how it's ending. It's almost a shame that so few people get to experience this. Root balances on a large root like it made a staircase just for them, their arms outstretched to balance their descent. The land is beautiful, but it can be downright terrible to those who harm it. So much of it has been tamed, though. It sometimes feel like, feels like it's been beaten into submission. What do you mean by that? They huff, kneeling down to sit on a mossy rock, resting their chin upon their palm. Their upbeat attitude about them noticeably dim diminishes with my question. A long time ago, when the sibling gods Ungara and Ungrath still walked upon these plains, they were quick to strike back when they felt they were wronged by the humans. Ungara was particularly angry. He said that he hunted to take his tribute, that it was in exchange for the price of what humans had taken from his land. He took lives to get bound, but sometimes he took too many. Oh boy. Hang on, I need more than just water. why he was angry. The land isn't as alive with so many people using it, abusing it even. It feels muted, the very life of it sucked away. They're not all bad, but I know that but I know that. You must be good, but he was too blinded by anger. If not for a spouse, the hunts would have continued to this day. Or so they said. They nod, a touch was grim now at the mention of his bay lover. They calmed his wild heart, but even then there was nothing, so much quiet. I don't know what happened to either of them, but that's when magic began to lead the land. For being so omnipotent, why would we even begin to understand their reasons? If they even had any. Maybe. I know some claim that Ungrad still walks on the mortal plane, that the haunted towns rife with fools or penance were a great crime. I don't know if there's any stock in that, but as you said before, the land can be frightening. Rules sh remove shutters and wrap their arms around their middle, hugging them so tight. Look tensed, eyebrows pinched, sympathy pulls from my gut at the sight. I can't help but feel a little guilty that I initiated such a conversation. I'm sorry, I didn't mean for that to take such a somber turn. No, don't apologize. It makes me sad, but you're certainly not to blame, not one bit. They smile, a hint of sadness still lingering in their brown eyes. I could see their attempt at showing their appreciation at least. There are far more wonderful things out there other than just magic, anyway. Now, come on. I should actually help you get home now, but I think the woods will help you on your next visit. We continue onward for a little while, Rue urging me to go first to test my new kind of friendship with the trees, I assume. The path definitely feels more straightforward now, far less fast, though. Maybe I'm imagining it, but that also seems brighter than before. I can hear soft giggles behind me. If I had to guess, I think they're pleased it worked. And honestly, saying, there's pride blooming in my chest for accomplishing such an unusual feat. But something begins to slowly chip, chip scare away. Okay, that's, I'm not sure what they're trying to put there. I'm looking at my feet and the trail has shifted, less direct. The wood begin to look at it, look as it had when I first entered with Eric. Did I do something wrong? 
A few more steps forward and I realize that something is definitely wrong. But I don't think it's me. Hmm? Did I make a mistake? I turn to look at them and they swallow hard with a vigorous shake of their head. No, you didn't. But I think there's something else here. Something else? I keep looking back and forth between what's ahead and what's behind. And when nothing comes, we simply continue with passion. Even though our pace is almost a crawl, I think I see the lights of the city ahead. I look back to Rue and Shrug, and they register my confidence. And there's probably nothing. Keep them close behind. But then I stop dead in my track. The hand stands back immediately to grab Rue, get a handful of their tunic to pull us behind the corner of a large cover of a large tree. It's a relief they don't make a sound, trusting me implicitly. I steal a glance over my shoulder to make sure they're okay. They don't even register them looking at them, and I quickly follow their line of sight to a line of what looks like the same lights as before, as the city. But then I quickly realize that it isn't. It's something new. We follow a single straight line, bobbing up and down, one after the other, the uniform movement telling me these are torchlights. They're evenly paced, and I can cut through the path they are in like the night. The shift in our surroundings firmly makes me believe that the forest has closed in on itself in protection, trying to confuse them in its labyrinthine depths, but they move without interruption or hesitation. I take shallow breath to try and clear my thoughts, attempting to release this nervous energy, but the more I try, the more I realize just how difficult it is to breathe all of a sudden. Like a miasma, like someone presses a firm hand upon my sternum and serves to suffocate me. I take another deep lean and look at the trail, watching those dancing lights drift by. They look ordinary at a glance, but there's an undeniable feeling that they're the center of this oppression, like a force that warns, stay away. I'm brought back from my reverie with a tug on my sleeve, Rue gently prodding at me. We need to go. Now. Anything typical of Ruth's any demeanor is absent. Their voice on edge, a bite to their words. The light of torches eventually fades and moves out into the night. And we're left standing here in the dark with a terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. Dun dun dun! As the end of night chapter two. So, cookie! The best for the kids. Music. Oh. Okay. Save. Okay. Yeah, we ended the adventure right in a flip finger as well. And we'll end the nomad right in a flip finger. They're very fond of the flip fingers. Okay. That's it for today, which is good. I, I need a break. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, next week, we will be continuing with the Nomad Chapter 2, which will be back with the judge. But this time, we'll be watching it from the cheap seat. Um, yeah. And getting closer and closer to choosing our romance options. Of course, I've already picked them, but I've been playing with everyone just because. So I hope everyone enjoyed this, and I will see you next time. Have a good week. <laughs>